<laughs> you guys will open your Bibles to our passage today. It's Luke chapter 8, page 917. The Bible's in the back. And you can stand if you're able. We'll be reading Luke chapter 8, 1 through 18. This is what it says. Afterward, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. As a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from every town, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other seed fell on the rock. When it grew up, it withered away, since it lacked moisture. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up with it and choked it. Still, other seed fell on good ground. When it grew up, it produced fruit, a hundred times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him, What does this parable mean? So he said, The secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know, but to the rest it is in the parables, so that looking they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the seed on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Having no root, these believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. As for the seed that fell among thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. But the seed in the good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it and by enduring produce fruit. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed, and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. Therefore, take care how you listen, for whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. You may be seated. Thank you. Awesome. My name is Matt Gurton, another Matt, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm excited to get into this passage with you. Um, we've been going through Luke, if you haven't been with us, and so we're at chapter 8 today, obviously. How many of you have spent some time outside doing some yard work over the last couple of weeks? Anybody raise your hands? All right, I can tell by the sunburns. Uh, welcome to the club. Um, that is probably going to help you understand today's passage if you've spent some time digging in the dirt a little bit, uh, you didn't know it, but you've been doing homework for church and hopefully that's gonna pay off today. But Jesus is gonna talk about dirt and how that relates to us, okay? So that's where we're going today. Um, so let's look at it. Chapter eight, verse one. If you're not there, get there and let's go through it. Um, last week, Pastor West talked about the woman uh, the sinful woman who comes to Jesus and just worships him by anointing his feet and, and wiping them with her hair and she's weeping. And he says, those who have been forgiven much love much. So that thing has just happened. And then we, Luke moves us to this passage. And he says, afterwards, so after that event had taken place, Jesus was traveling from one town and village to another. So he's just going all over the place. He's not like on his way from one place to another. He's just traveling, speaking about the kingdom of God. He's sharing the good news to whoever would listen. Preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, so that's the 12 disciples, all dudes. But then look at this, verse two. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. But not only that, Mary called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her, like she was completely filled with demons. 
But then there's this interesting thing. Verse three, he says, Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. And it's kind of this interesting three verse thing in the middle of what's going on here. But it's very much on purpose because Luke loves to highlight how Jesus was continually connecting with, reaching out to, inviting in those that society and culture at the time pushed out. The marginalized, the sick, the demon possessed, and also the women. And so Luke not only lists by name women, he says there were many of them that were part of Jesus' followers. And not only that, women who were sick, women who were demon-possessed. So again, really ostracized. But then you have this woman who's the, the wife of one of Herod's stewards in Herod's temple or Herod's palace. And so clearly it's a woman of means and a woman of influence. Like, so you have people in different classes that are following Jesus. And then it says many others who were helping fund and support Jesus' ministry. And what is so uh, groundbreaking about this is that no other rabbi at the time would teach women. They would not let the women come around and be part of the teaching. And Jesus is like, come on. He included women right from the start. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's something the church today is still learning uh, to value everybody uh, in the gifts that God has given them. Verse four, as a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from every town. Pause. So he just took three verses to tell us this variety of women from all different classes, how they're following Jesus. And he's been going around from town to town. And now it says that a crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from every town. So again, I think this is pointing to a diversity of people. You surely have young and old, male and female, various social status, the sick, the healthy, diff people of different ethnicities, this large crowd is forming and following Jesus. And the crowd is so big at this point that Matthew in his gospel tells us, that, tells us that Jesus gets into a boat and casts off a little offshore so that he can have some space so that he can address the crowd. And so just picture Jesus standing in a boat out on the water, or probably sitting uh, out on the water, speaking to them. And this really sets the stage for what is one of Jesus' most well-known parables the parable of the four soils, or the parable of the sower. Three of the four gospels record this, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think it's pretty clear that what Jesus is about to say applies to everyone in that crowd. And I think Luke on purpose highlights the diversity of the crowd because of what Jesus is about to say. So it's not just the Jewish leaders that Jesus is speaking to. It's not just the poor and the ostracized. It's not just the rich. It's not just men or it's not just women. It's not just people living in the Middle East in the first century. Jesus' message that day applied to everybody and applies to us in the same way today. Amen? We believe that's true of all of God's word, but you're gonna see it particularly here. This story, this parable he's gonna tell applies to all of us. Now, some people have said that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's an allegory used to illustrate something. And Jesus used parables and stories a lot as he would teach people. And so today, Jesus is going to pull an illustration out of their daily life to teach them something. So it was a very agrarian society. Lots of people farmed far more than what we experience today. These people had to farm to survive. And so this was very familiar to them. So again, like I've asked you to do before, I want you to really use your imagination here. Because Jesus is telling a story, a very earthy, pun intended, story that we can all relate to in many ways. So picture Jesus sitting on that boat a little bit offshore, tons of people listening. This is what he says, verse five. A sower went out to sow seed. We're gonna see very clear that homeboy is just throwing seed everywhere. He's just chucking seed liberally and freely. He's making sure seed gets to every part of the field. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. Now the path would subdivide different sections of the field or your field from your neighbor's field. It was the worn down road 
of packed, hard dirt. So some seed fell on the path and it was trampled on and the birds of the sky devour it. Picture the birds eating the seed off the path. Other seed fell on the rock and when it grew up, it withered away since it lacked moisture. In Palestine, there are many areas where just below the surface of dirt is just sheeting, sheets of rock. It's just a very rocky area in some places. There's not much soil. And so it was common that if you threw some seed on there, it would spring up quickly, but then it would die because the roots weren't very deep. So this seed is going everywhere. Verse seven, other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. Other seed, or still other seed fell on good ground. And when it grew up, it produced fruit a hundred times what was sown. As he said this, Jesus called out, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. And so he mentions these four soils. There's hard soil. There's shallow soil. That's the rocky soil where there's not much dirt. Yesterday, I was preparing some of our landscaped areas and uh, pulling out some weeds and stuff. And a few years ago, we haven't done it in a couple of years. A few years ago, we laid down that weed barrier stuff. That's a pain in the butt to put down, but it's helpful. And, but we had neglected it so long that weeds were starting to grow and grass was starting to grow, even though that we had put that down. And as I started pulling them, I realized very quickly, these, this huge chunk of weeds, as I pulled it out, it came up very easily. And all the roots were like horizontal because the roots hadn't penetrated that root bar the weed barrier, it had grown on top of it. And whatever little bit of soil or mulch was there, the weeds were able to grow there, but the roots weren't able to go deep. I was able to pull it right out. It's like the shallow, rocky soil. So you have the hard soil, the shallow soil, the thorny soil, and then the good soil. And Jesus ends there with, let anyone who has ears to listen, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. The other day, Devin was kind of showing me what needed to be done because she was going to be working yesterday and so kind of gave me my assignments and she gets back last night after being at work and I'm doing other things in the yard and she goes, you didn't pull out the whatever it's called. I was like, I thought you said I was supposed to. You said, you can just pull that out. I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. She did say, you can pull that out. But then she continued to say, and replant it somewhere else. I pulled it out and replanted it in the trash can. <laughs> Sometimes we hear, but we're not really listening. Fellas, am I right? We'll move on. Jesus is saying, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Listen to what I'm saying. Verse nine, then his disciples asked him, hey, Jesus, what are you talking about? What does this parable mean? You're talking about a bunch of dirt and some seed. Big deal, I don't get it. What are you getting at? So Jesus said, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know but to the rest, it is in parables so that looking they may not see and hearing they may not understand. In your Bible, it's probably in bold that looking they may not see or it's in quotation marks. And that is because Jesus is quoting directly from the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter six, God speaks through his prophet Isaiah to his people. He's calling them out for their idolatry that they had wandered from him once again or worshiping other things. They've hardened their hearts against him. And even though they hear his word from the prophets, they don't listen and they're continuing in their sin. And so in turn in Isaiah six, the Lord says, all right, you're not listening. Your hearts are hardened. Well, I'm gonna make sure you keep hearing and not listening. And he doesn't allow them to turn. And so Jesus is saying, that's the purpose of these parables. I tell these things in parables so that you guys get it, but so that other people whose hearts are hard don't get it. You're like, that's confusing. I thought the whole point of using allegory and metaphor was to help everybody understand. And Jesus is like, no, it's to expose it to those who really want to know and to veil it from those whose hearts are hard. Leon Morris writes this. He says, the crowds were thronging about Jesus. He was becoming a popular teacher, but he looked for more than superficial adherence. 
So Jesus intensified his use of parables, stories which yield their meaning only to those prepared to search for it. Listen, the parables demand thought and spiritual earnestness. They separate the sincere seeker from the casual hearer. Parables are meant to reveal the truth to the sincere and hide it from the insincere. And Paul kind of alludes to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Like, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But it's the power of God to us who are being saved. Okay, look at verse 11. Jesus says, all right, I'll tell you. This is the meaning of the parable. And it's very simple. Number one, the seed that the sower was sowing, the seed is the word of God. How many of you know there's nothing wrong with the word of God? The problem isn't the word of God being sown. He's gonna tell us what the problem is. The seed is the word of God. Verse 12, the seed along the path are those who have heard and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. He's saying the seed that fell on the path, it's the path our hearts that are hard, that their hearts are deaf to the voice of the Lord. They don't even hear it. They don't recognize it. They don't care. And in that way, Satan comes in, in essence, and steals the word of God. It's not able to go in to sink in at all. That's one of the types of hearts that people have. Maybe you can remember a time where your heart was in that place where people would try to tell you about the Lord or try to tell you about the things of the Lord and you just didn't care. You'd even get angry when they would talk about God. You're like, I don't want anything to do with religion. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. A heart that was hard. He continues, verse 13, and the seed on the rock or the shallow soil are those who when they hear, receive the word with joy. But having no root, these believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. And so these are like those who have an emotional experience with the word of God or an emotional experience with the presence of the Lord. Maybe it's a church service or a special service or God does something in their life. They, they pray a desperation prayer and, and their prayer is answered the way that they, they wanted it to be. And they have this huge emotional thing where they're like, God is real. But what too often happens there is that it stops there. Now listen carefully, emotion is not bad. Emotion is not wrong. Our emotions are God-given blessings from him. But emotion by itself is not complete and it's not enough. Emotions are meant to point us to deeper things. And as we have an encounter with the Lord that that may be supernatural or really moving or, or powerful, it's meant to drive us deeper into his word and to know him better. But if we stop at the emotional experience, When life gets hard, or when it's not popular to believe certain truths of the Bible, it's super easy to wither away, amen? Our faith has to be rooted in the truth of God's word and not just in our experience or our emotional state of the day, amen. Then he continues for the fourth, the third soil, verse 14. As for the seed that fell among thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. In essence, he's saying that these are people who receive God's word and and tend to believe it, but as time goes by, the idols of their heart are exposed and the idols of their heart choke out the growth of God's word in them. It chokes out the fruitfulness of the gospel at work in their lives. It's when our affection is divided. Matthew chapter six, Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so if we are beginning to treasure our financial security more than the Lord, it's a thorn that begins to choke out the gospel. If we begin to treasure our reputation or our appearance or fun and pleasure and comfort, those are the thorns that creep up in our lives or can creep up in our lives and choke out the fruitfulness of God's word in our lives. I just want to live my life right now. I'll get serious with God later. It's a thorn. But then he also mentions worries. It's not just pleasure, but also the worries of life 
grow up and choke out the fruitfulness. All of us have anxieties in life. We all face loss and hardship and suffering in some similar and in some different and unique ways. But the thing is that our loss and our hardship, they lie to us. They lie to us by saying that God isn't good, doesn't see us, he doesn't hear us, he doesn't care, he must not be there. And they're thorns that choke out the fruit that God wants to produce in our lives. And then he talks about the final soil, verse 15. But the seed and the good ground, these are the ones who having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it. They hold on to it. They hold on to God's word. They hold on to the truth of God's word. In John chapter six, Jesus begins teaching some hard things of what it will cost and what it looks like to follow him and what it means to be a disciple. And John six tells us that when the crowd start hearing these hard teachings, they're like, I'm out. <laughs> like, okay, the free lunch was good, but this is where my path with Jesus ends. This is just too weird. I'm out. And in those moments, Jesus turns to his disciples in John six and says, what are you guys gonna do? Are you out too? Are you gonna leave like everybody else? And what does Peter say? Where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of life. Peter was holding on to the seed of God's word. Pressure was coming, he didn't have it all figured out. It wasn't popular in those moments to keep following Jesus, but his heart was holding on to the words of life, the good seed and good soil. So hold on to it and by enduring, it's not gonna be easy. Jesus said life wasn't gonna be easy. There's not always gonna be those emotional experiences where things spring up quickly. There will be thorns to deal with, but by enduring, produce fruit. So you can read this and maybe like me this week, it's like, okay, I've heard this parable a really long time. I've heard lots of teaching on it. And it's like, okay, I think I get it. Like I get what Jesus is saying, but it's like, so what? What do I do with that? If it's true that only Jesus can change the heart, then what do I do with that? Well, Jesus shares another metaphor right on the heels of this that doesn't seem related at first. And I think a lot of times, you, when you just follow the headings in your Bible that weren't there originally, somebody put those in later, those aren't inspired by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they could throw you off because what's actually happening is these next few verses are Jesus continuing his thought. It's the same speech. And the next few verses help us kind of hone in on what's the point of Jesus sharing this? Look at this real quick. Verse 16, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but they put it on a lampstand so that all those who come in may see its light. The purpose of lighting a candle or a lamp is so that light can be shared, just like seed is meant to be sown. It's meant to be scattered. Let your light shine. Okay, so that's tracking. Verse 17, for nothing is concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. When the light is turned on in a house, it reveals what was in the darkness, right? When the light comes on, you're like, oh, that's really what was happening. That's really what's going on in the room. Just like the sown seed reveals the quality of the soil. Do you see that? When the seed is sown, it reveals by res the response it evokes what kind of soil is there? So you're like, oh, I'm tracking Jesus. He's using another metaphor to get his point across, but we can miss it too easily. Last verse, verse 18. Therefore, so 18 verses in, we get the, what's the point? Because all of this is true. All of these things I've just been telling you, therefore, Take care how you listen. 
For whoever has, more will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. The seed that fell on good soil produced, produced, that's not a word, produced a hundredfold. Therefore, take care how you listen. Matt, I don't get it. What are you saying? Here's the point. Take care how you listen. I think Jesus, with the crowd that day, as the crowd is stirring and more and more people are coming out and it's excited and everything, it's like Jesus sitting on the boat that day and saying, time out. Time out. We need to have a little heart to heart. We need to have a little reality check. Friends, it's a time for self-reflection. I'm gonna hold up a mirror. And there are four possibilities of where your heart's at today as you hear me teaching you things. There are four possibilities of the state that your heart is in and what you are doing with my words that I'm sharing with you. Therefore, take care how you listen. Just like in verse eight, it's the same admonition. As he said this, he called out, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. The point of this parable is he's challenging us. Are you really paying attention? Are you really listening to my words? Is my word going deep in your heart or are you like Matt who threw away his wife's plans because he didn't really listen? The NASB version of the Bible more literally translates what's going on here. That verse says, and as he said these things, he would call out. So it's like, as he's teaching, it's almost like what I do and other preachers do like, are you with me? Does that make sense? Do you get what I'm saying? Did you hear what I just said? Listen again. As he said these things, he would call out. He kept checking in with them like, are you listening? Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you taking a look at your own heart? Are you self-reflecting? Are you allowing my spirit to search you? What is the state of your heart? We're almost done. Galatians chapter six. And like, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Only God can change the heart. Well, Galatians six says this. Paul shares an important principle for all of life. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Like he set life up the way it's supposed to go. This is a principle. God's not mocked. You can't cheat his system. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. How are we tending our hearts are we really listening to the Lord? Is his word going deep into our hearts? Or are our hearts just hard and calloused and things that used to move us and challenge us just don't anymore? Or is life just full of anxieties and worries and the pursuit of pleasure because it's being choked out? Or maybe you're here and you started coming to local and you maybe loved the music or you loved how people loved you and you're like, oh, this is amazing. And this is a huge emotional rush, which is a good thing. But if it just stopped there and if in subsequent weeks, you're like, well, this isn't so great. Maybe I won't go next week. Is your heart shallow? Where maybe you've been chasing an experience instead of receiving the word of God to go deep in you. How are we tending the soil of our hearts? Are we quick to pull the weeds of pride and pleasure and idolatry when they see them? Weeds of selfishness. Are we plowing our hard hearts in prayer and the word? Friends, I, I love how the Lord has led us to pray more lately and we've got a long way to go and it's a lifelong pursuit of growing in our communion and, and conversation with the Lord. I know that lately I, my heart has been more stirred to pray. It's more of my first reaction instead of my 10th reaction. That's a work of his spirit. And I am so grateful that he's been doing that among all of us. That is one way that the spirit breaks up a hard heart is through prayer. 
I was just talking with somebody the other day. You know, it's really hard to hate somebody that you continually pray for. It's really hard to stay mad at somebody that you continually pray for. If you have somebody in your life that you just can't stand, make it a discipline to start praying for them and watch what the Lord will start to do to your heart. Prayer, going to the Lord, humbling ourselves before him is a way of breaking up a hard heart as is spending time in his word. And so I wanna invite you just to bow and I wanna echo what Jesus just told us twice. Are you listening? Are you hearing? We can't do this apart from the spirit of God at work and so let's humble ourselves in this moment and ask for help. And so Jesus, would you search our hearts today? As you've held up this mirror that serves as four categories, Lord, would you search us, Lord? Lord, maybe by your grace in this moment, there's someone here who's had a hard heart, who has denied you, has ignored you, has blasphemed you and profaned your name and their heart has just been hard. Holy Spirit, would you begin to break up that soil today? Would your word go deep in them? For those, Lord, who maybe have been uh, chasing an emotional experience, trying to relive something uh, in a way maybe they experienced of you in the past, Lord, would you break through that rock, Lord? Would you cause the roots to go deep? That their faith and trust and growth in you would be based on your word and who you are and your faithfulness to them and not by the mood or experience of the day. Lord, for those of us who are being choked by the concerns of life, whether it's the pursuit of pleasure, security, significance, or even being choked by suffering, Lord, our eyes have diverted from you, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you help us to pull those weeds that your seed can continue to go deep and grow tall, that we would bear fruit for your kingdom, Jesus. Lord, continue to make the soil in our hearts rich, that even the slightest seed that comes in each day, it's a little nudge from your spirit, Lord, a, a, a verse that we hear, a, a, a song lyric that comes to mind that's pointing us to you, that our hearts would be so responsive. And that in turn, Lord, we would become like you. You've invited us to be like the sower. We just spread the good news of who you are. We spread the gospel. We shine the light to those around us. It's not our job to know and to decide whose heart's in the right place to hear it. Our job is just to spread it and to trust you with the results, Lord. We thank you for this reminder today. We thank you for this challenge. And Lord, we thank you that it's your work that we get to join you in. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with this encouragement um, from another prophet. Prophet Ezekiel, God's people once again had blown it and made a mess of everything. And they were under the judgment of the Lord for their defilement and sin. And God makes them this promise in the midst of that. And because we are God's people today, this is his heart toward us. It's what he provided for us on the cross and in his resurrection. It's what he promises, like we just said, when he comes again. It's because of what he does here and what he does in our hearts. He says this, he promises, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you, which is what we celebrate at Pentecost. He did it and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Go today in the confidence that he has done that. If you have placed your faith in him is because he has substituted a hard heart that hated him with a heart of flesh and he's made you his own. 
May you enjoy your day today and tomorrow. God bless you as you go into this week. Amen.